The term hoot owl can be confusing because it applies to both the barred owl and the great horned owl because both of these widespread owls do hoot. Barred owls typically do eight hoots. Male great horned owls do five. And what's more, the two species look quite a bit alike. They're similar in size and coloring, though the great horned is mostly tan and gray with a bit of white thrown in, while the bard is dark brown and ivory. So if you're interested in a primer on the differences between these two owls, with some info about their nesting and sex lives thrown in, then look no further. The barred owl is common throughout the eastern half of the continent and has been spreading throughout the Pacific Northwest and down into California. Birding author Pete Dunn describes the bard as a barrel-shaped, somber-eyed owl that looks like it's wearing a shabby, stain-streaked coat with a closed fur collar. His back is dark brown with white speckles. Notice also that his facial disc is off-white and he has a yellow bill. The great horned owl is more widespread, found everywhere in North America. The male's five hoots are the iconic owl call, one of the most familiar bird calls in the world. As for the great horned owl's appearance, Pete Dunn nails it again. Noting the bird's expression of sleepy malice, Dunn describes him as a necklace, broad-faced beer keg of a bird, topped with the devil's own horns. They're not really horns, nor are they ears, much as they may remind you of feline ears. They're just tufts of feathers. Those tufts, together with his white necklace that's especially obvious at dawn and dusk, make the great horned easy to identify. Oh, and his facial disc is orange-brown instead of off-white. Nor does he have the dark, somber eyes of the bard. His eyes are amber. Here's a female great horned who looks exactly like the male, except that she's a third again larger than her mate. And that's true of most raptors, that the females are larger than the males. Ooh, that is some spooky looking blank stare. But actually what looks like empty eyes are just her furry lower lids raised in sleep. And the ability to raise their lower lids is one of the many cool traits of owls in general. Great horned owls nest in January and February undeterred by cold weather because even their eyelids help keep them warm. They nest early for a couple of reasons. First, because longer nights give them more hours to hunt for all the food their growing family needs. And second, because their young, unlike songbird young, need many months to learn how to hunt effectively, and they need good weather while they hone those skills. So if they're out of the nest in March, they've got all spring, summer, and early fall to strengthen those wings and master the use of them. Barred owls nest later, especially in the southeast where they are common in swampy areas. That works for them because the warmer weather there makes early nesting unnecessary for the fledglings. And what's more, the bard doesn't need so many nighttime hours for hunting because he's more willing to hunt during the day. Now you know, of course, that since both species are mainly nocturnal, you're much more likely to hear them than to see them which works out fine, actually, since their calls are so easy to learn. <laughs> the barred owl's eight hoot call is easy, too. There's even a mnemonic for it. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? <laughs> they sound pretty much like they have a kazoo stuck in their throat both of the sexes, because their calls are virtually the same. Hers is a little bit higher pitched, but really the only way you're likely to know that you're hearing a female is that she may have a tremolo at the end that the male doesn't have. Of course, you can't depend on the calls being exactly eight hoots. 
The owls deviate from the pattern as the mood strikes them. Sometimes it seems like they just cough up the first few notes. Ooh, 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 cooks for you. Or offer just half the call. Who cooks for you? And then quit. They have their moods. Oh boy, do they have moods. Those eight hoots can morph into a maniacal cacophony of barks, laughs, cackles, and hooted guffaws. This one's mate is about to join him for a demonic duet. Jungles of Borneo don't sound that eerie and threatening. It's enough to make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, especially if you hear it when you're alone outside in the dark, wondering if some orangutan slash jaguar was about to pounce. I used to think it was probably part of courtship, the cackle of ecstasy, I called it, but it's not. Like the eight hoots, the funhouse cackling is territorial. It's a pair of them, emphatically claiming their territory. And the outburst is usually prompted by them hearing another barred owl nearby. Since I've heard their echo chamber zaniness more than once in August and early September, too late in the year for them to be mating here in Missouri, I should have figured that out for myself. But I didn't until I read that owl experts say it's territorial. And then I realized how much sense that made. <laughs> I mean, if you were another owl hearing that spine-freezing madness, wouldn't you at least consider the wisdom of leaving them alone? But you wouldn't be cowed by it if you were a great horned owl, the barred owl's slightly larger, much more aggressive cousin, the only predator who bosses barred owls around. The odd thing is that, fierce as the great horned owl is, his mellow call is a velvet fog. Now both of these owls hoot, both of them leaning forward to do it, but they don't really sound much alike. One's a kazoo, The other's a muted bassoon. <laughs> the great horned female's hooting is higher pitched, quicker, and longer. It's somewhere between six and nine notes. She sounds like she's asking a question and answering herself. The eight hoot and five hoot calls of the two species are territorial but it looks to me like they also serve to cement the pair bond. Sort of like both birds declaring their shared territory and their intention to do more than just share territory. Now I've had more chance to observe great horned owls. We've had a pair in the woods behind our house for 14 years now, and that's why the barred owls don't show up. I hear them hooting tenderly to each other all throughout the autumn. Yes, their sweet conversations would also serve to alert other owls that this territory is taken. But the territorial part of it seems to me almost incidental. Throughout January, they pledge their commitment to each other in duets. Duets that are like a steamy tango. A tango which might climax with a climax. I filmed that duet after dark, but I knew they were mated because I recognized the male screech from when I had filmed them all bow chikiwawa in daylight. 
One reason I feel like the territorial call doubles as a mating call is that this great horned female softly hooted the territorial call when the male swooped down on her. Of course, it's true that the male didn't hoot at that point. He screamed. And having learned once that my guesses about their territorial calls were wrong, I'm cautious about contradicting people who know more than I do. But I can't resist thinking of their soft calls as the pledges of sweet, faithful lovers. <laughs>